Hey everybody, I'm Brad and uh, this is Mountainside Tabletop. Hey folks, I'm Vic and today we're going to be going through everything you need to know to get going with Star Wars Shatterpoint, a brand new skirmish game in the Star Wars universe. Massive hype. Yep. All right, everybody, we're super excited for this game. Vic and I are both huge Star Wars fans, and like we've been waiting for this to come out for months, since it was announced, basically. Today, we're gonna go through a mini shortened battle report and explain everything we're doing along the way just to get you up to speed and ready to play this game. Since this is a brand new game, there's always gonna be some evolution in the understanding of rules, as well as some updates from Atomic Mass. So. Take a look in the description whenever you're watching this, and we'll be sure to keep it updated with any of the most recent rules changes and corrections. We're not gonna waste time with boring intro BS, so uh, we're gonna get right into it. This is where the fun begins, Vic. This is where the fun begins. To play a game of Shatterpoint, you need some minis and terrain. You'll need a handful of measuring gauges, dice, a struggle tracker, and some cards and tokens. All of this, along with anything else you'll need to play a game of Shatterpoint, can be found in the core set. To find out more about the core set and everything else to do with Star Wars Shatterpoint, head to the link in our description. By following this link, you can find the core rules for this game for free, online, amazing. And also, following this link helps us out by helping ensure that we continue to get review copies of Shatterpoint releases and uh, bring more content to you, which is great. Yeah, worth noting that we're under no obligation to have any uh, sort of favorable opinion, but we definitely do. Yeah. <laughs> to win a game of Shatterpoint, a player has to move the struggle token onto the same space as one of their momentum tokens using the struggle tracker. At the end of each turn after the first, the active player will move the struggle token a number of spaces equal to the number of objectives they control. Certain situations will cause a player to add a momentum token to their side of the struggle tracker, but we'll cover these as they come up in the game. Shatterpoint uses specialized 8-sided attack dice and 6-sided defense dice. On the attack dice, the faces are critical, strike, attack expertise, and failure. The defense dice feature block, defense expertise, and failure. We'll explain more about how these are used as it comes up. In Shatterpoint, your army is referred to as your strike team. Each strike team is made up of two squads, and here is one squad. Each squad contains one primary unit, one secondary unit, and one supporting unit. My primary unit is going to be Ahsoka Tano, Jedi No More. Ahsoka's card has the Clone Wars mark and eight squad points. This means that my secondary and supporting units must come from the Clone Wars era and equal no more than eight points in total. My secondary unit is Bo-Katan Kryze and my support unit will be the Clan Kryze Mandalorians, both of whom are worth four points, bringing my total to eight. My squad, on the other hand, is gonna feature Lord Maul, Gar Saxon, Merciless Commander, and some Mandalorian Super Commandos. Lord Maul is my primary, and like Ahsoka, he provides 8 squad points to spend and is from the Clone Wars era. Gar Saxon is worth 4 points, the Mandalorian Super Commandos are worth 4 points, that adds up to 8, I can do, actually do some math, <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my squad. Now, like we mentioned, normally you'd be playing with two squads, not just one, but for this short learn to play game, we're just going to be dealing with one squad each. Before we play the game, we first need to set up some terrain. Today we'll be using some of the terrain from the core set. It's important to have a good mix of cover and verticality to make sure the terrain is evenly dispersed around the map and doesn't give one side a starting advantage. Typically, a game of Shatterpoint is played on a 3 foot by 3 foot surface with 9 objective markers. For today's Learn to Play mission, we're going to play it on a mat half that size with only 3 objectives. Additionally, we're going to make the central objective here the priority objective. This means that controlling this objective counts for two spaces on the struggle tracker. It's worth double the other objectives. At the start of the game, we both create our Will of the Force pools. We'll use these force points for different abilities and interactions throughout the game. 
These pools are calculated by adding up all of the force stats from your unit's cards. We both only have three for this battle, drawing from Ahsoka and Maul's cards. In a full game, it would typically be at least double that. Now, the last step before we really get into the battle is to choose sides and determine which one of us will be the first player. To do this, we're going to both roll five attack dice. Whoever rolls the most critical results is the first player. In the case of a tie, you can compare hits and then expertise results if it's still a tie. Vic rolled more crits than me, and that means he's the first player. In Shatterpoint, you deploy one squad at a time, alternating between players. To deploy a squad, place a primary character within range 2 of the battlefield edge, and then the rest of the squad within range 1 of that primary. As the first player, I get to deploy first. Here I'll set up Ahsoka first, and then the rest of the Mandalorians eyeing this middle objective. After Vic, I deploy, so I'm going to place Maul. And then place everybody else around him. Throughout the game, players alternate activating units. To decide which unit to activate, you draw a card from your order deck. You must activate this unit, or decide to save them for later and put them in reserve by spending one force point. During a unit's activation, it can make up to two actions. Some special rules or abilities grant actions. If an action is granted by an effect, it does not count as one of the unit's two actions. Each unit can make any action only once per activation. So for the first activation, I draw Bo-Katan. Her order card shows the Tactics Ability icon this reminds me that she has a tactics ability, which will be resolved at the beginning of her activation. This ability is called Pride of the Mandalore. It lets me choose one Mandalorian character with whom I can make a free jump action. Vic chooses one of his clan Kree's Mandalorians to benefit from this jump, and he goes ahead and performs the jump. To use the movement measurement tools, you touch the end with the little indent up to the round base of the character you're gonna move, angle the tool in any way you'd like, and then place the character's base anywhere that's in contact with the movement tool. In the case of a jump, you use the dash tool, which is the shorter one. So this Mandalorian moves to the base of a ladder, which is referred to as an ingress point in the game. When a character ends an advance, climb, dash, or jump movement within range one of an ingress point, they can choose to use the ingress point. If they do so, you can place them within range one of any other connected ingress point. In this example, the top and bottom of the ladder are the two connected ingress points. Now, Bo-Katan is going to spend one force point on her jetpack ability and similarly jump to the ingress point and end up beside her comrade. Next, I'm going to do a focus action. And then, with my final action, take a shot at Gar Saxon. Taking a look at Bo Katan's stance card, I can see that her ranged attack has a range of 4. I quickly check, and Gar Saxon is well within that range. When measuring in this way, you never count vertical distance. Now, when I go to check, I can confirm that I have line of sight and Gar Saxon is not in cover. So next, we form our dice pools. We can see that Bo-Katan's ranged attack gets 6 attack dice, and Gar Saxon's ranged defense has 4 defense dice. Since I focused, I add one more to that pool, so I'm going to be rolling 7 attack dice. I roll 1 crit, 3 hits, 1 expertise, and 2 fails. Brad rolls 3 blocks and 1 fail. So now, I'll remove my 2 fails, and then consulting my stance card, see that I convert my one expertise into an extra strike. Then I remove Gar Saxon's one fail. 
Next, each one of my blocks removes one of Vic's strikes. So, Vic is left with one critical strike and one regular strike, and those convert into two successes. So taking a look at my stance card again, I can move two spaces down my damage tree. I'm going to choose the top path here. First, I'll add two damage to the damage pool. Then, on the second step, I'll add one more damage and pin Gar Saxon. So, at this point, Brad will apply the three damage of the pin token to Gar Saxon's card. At the end of Vic's turn, we check for objective control. This central objective is controlled by Vic because he has more characters within range 2 of the objective token. We put down a token to denote that he controls the objective, but because this is the first turn of the game, he doesn't move the struggle tracker. Alright, now it's my turn. So I go to my unit order deck and draw a card. I turn over the Mandalorian Super Commandos. The Mandalorian Super Commandos count as one unit, but this unit contains two characters. Any action that the unit performs is performed by both characters. With my first action, I'm going to move and choose to advance. With this, I get to move using the long movement tool. As I mentioned, because there are two characters in this unit, both of them get to make a move action. In this case, I'm advancing with both of them, but I could advance with one and jump with the other if I wanted to. Next, with my second action, I'm going to take cover. When you take cover, each character in the unit may be pushed, range one, and then the unit gains a hunker token. Now you might notice in the box, there's no range one measurement stick, but the short edge of any of the range tools count as range one. So I put a hunker token on the unit card, and this applies to both characters. Then at the end of my turn, I check for objective control. I do gain control of this objective by the crate, and then I get to move the struggle tracker. Since I only control one objective, and it's not the priority objective, I'm just going to move the struggle tracker one square toward my side. Then my turn's done. To start my turn, I draw the Clan Kree's Mandalorians. I don't really want to use them right now, so I'm going to pay a force token to put them into reserve. So I flip over the next card in my deck and draw Ahsoka. The first thing I'm going to do is change her stance to Jar Kai, which is a little bit more offensive because I'm feeling pretty aggressive. I'm going to spend my final force token on force speed. This allows me to make an advance action in addition to my other normal one. Once I enter engagement range with these Mandalorians, they lose their Hunker token. A character is engaged with enemy characters that are within range 2 of it, at the same elevation and within line of sight. Next, I'll make a combat action targeting the Mandalorians. I'm hoping to wound them here so that I can control this point. Once a unit is wounded, it can no longer contest objectives until it is activated again. So I consult my stance card and I see that I get to roll 7 attacks. Brad's pretty good at melee defense, and he's going to get 5 defense dice. So, I roll and I get 2 hits, 3 expertise, and 2 misses, which is uh, pretty bad. Brad rolls his 5 dice, getting 2 saves, 2 misses, and 1 expertise. I remove my misses and convert the expertise to 2 crits. Brad saves the 2 normal strikes, so I get to go 2 spaces on my damage tree with the 2 criticals. So, I'm going to allocate two damage first, and then one more damage and a disarm token. Unfortunately, the Mandalorians are still standing, so I don't control this point yet, so I only get to score the two points for controlling the middle token. Alright, I'm up again. So I flip my next order card, and I draw Gar Saxon. First up, he has the same tactical ability that Bo-Katan has. One of my other Mandalorians can perform a jump. So, it's not going to do too much, but I will jump with this Super Commando. Then, I really want to get rid of this pinned token. I'm going to spend one force on Gar's jetpack ability. Now, because of the pinned token, I'm not going to be able to actually move at all, but the pin token will go away, so that's a plus. Next up, I'll make a move action to advance. And then finally, I'll perform the combat action to make a ranged attack, targeting the Clan Kree's Mandalorian on the priority objective. I check for line of sight, 
and I do have it. Then I check for cover, and under normal circumstances, yes, this Mandalorian, being on a higher elevation, would have cover. However, Gar has an innate ability. I've got you in my sights. One of the effects of this ability is that he just ignores cover, basically, so the cover has no effect here. If the Mandalorian did have cover, it would just roll one extra defense die. So we perform the attack. After all is said and done, I'll be left with two successes, which will move me two spaces on my stance card. I'll be able to allocate three damage to the Clan Kree's Mandalorians, and I'll get to jump. Now with this jump, I can completely ignore all vertical movement, and make it all the way onto this high objective. So at the end of my turn, I check for control, I control two objectives, and I move the struggle tracker two spaces towards my side. Alright, to start my turn, I draw my Shatter Point card. This allows me to activate any unit I please. So, of course, I'm going to activate Ahsoka. With my first action, I'm going to focus, and then I'm going to attack these Mandos. I get a great roll here, and I'm able to go all the way down my damage tree on the stance card. This does all the damage necessary to wound the Mandalorians, and gives me an added bonus of shoving them back off the point. When moving an object towards or away from a character, you determine which direction everything moves by using the movement tool bent to 90 degrees. Yeah, you just put it like this and you can't move them outside of the arms of the tool. They'll also gain a disarm and pin token, but since they were already disarmed, that'll just do an extra damage. Since I wounded those Mandalorians, I get to add one momentum to my side of the struggle tracker. And then at the end of the turn, since I control the priority objective and the side objective, I get to move the struggle token three spaces to my side. Yep, that's right. Wounded characters can't hold objectives, so uh, Ahsoka just takes this one by the crates. Alright, my turn up next, and I draw Maul. At last we will reveal ourselves to the Jedi. At last we will have revenge. He's got a pretty spicy ability here. Sustained by Rage. This is his signature and it lets him, while he's not wounded, take damage instead of spending force for abilities. So I'm gonna use There is no place to run and take two damage. I'm gonna pick a character within range three of Maul, which in this case will be Bo-Katan. Then I will pull her range two toward Maul. I get to completely yeet her off this building, which is pretty sweet. She also gains an exposed token. Next, I'm going to take one more damage to use the Force Speed ability. This just lets me advance. Unfortunately, because I'm within range 2 of Bo-Katan and therefore engaged with Bo-Katan, my advance gets nerfed to a dash. However, I can dash close to this ingress point and move up the ladder. Then, with my first action, yeah, I haven't even used an action yet, uh, I'm going to make a combat against the Clan Kree's Mandalorians. Another benefit of my Sustained by Rage ability is that because I have three damage on Maul's card, I get to roll an extra attack dice. So I'll be rolling eight attack dice here. I get a great roll, and I'm gonna run my way down the middle track of Maul's Dark Rage stance card. I deal a bunch of damage and get a bunch of shoves, so I'm able to push this Mandalorian off the building and I wound them. When a unit has a number of damage tokens equal to or greater than its stamina characteristic, it immediately becomes wounded. While wounded, units can no longer contest objectives. Because damage and wounds and all the tokens are unit-wide, this wounding applies to the other Mandalorian that's not even nearby. That attack did enough to wound and shove these Mandalorians, even though they had protection and steadfast active from Bo-Katan's Some of Us Serve a Higher Purpose ability. All right, Maul has one more activation he can make here, but uh, this is a practice game. I'm just trying to move everything along, so I'm not gonna make one. And also I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Worth noting though, that you don't have to make two actions on your turn. You may make up to two, but you don't have to make all two. So only making one is legal. My lord, is that legal? Only making one is legal. 
Because I wounded a unit, I get to add one momentum token to my side of the struggle tracker. Then I check for control, and I get to move the struggle token three squares toward my side. Well, all I have left to activate is my Clan Kree's Bandalorian sitting in reserve. The first thing I do is change their wounded token to an injured token and remove all of their damage and up to one condition token. This means that they can now control objectives again, however all of their active and reactive abilities all cost an extra force token. Even the free ones now cost one. Spiced. If a unit has a number of injured tokens equal to its durability statistic, it becomes defeated and is removed at the end of its next activation. Alright, now with their first action, they're going to shoot at Maul. So they both get an attack here. The first one is very bad and it all misses and Brad saves the rest. The second attack does 3 damage and shoves Maul off the side of this building. Unfortunately, Maul had four defensive expertise, which lets him heal twice and jump back up to the top. For their second action, the Mandos are both going to advance to the ingress point to recapture this middle objective. At the end of the turn, I'm going to gain three struggle points. These Mandalorians were the last card in my order deck, so now I get to refresh my deck and my force tokens. So I shuffle them all back up and flip over the force tokens. All right, back to my turn and I get my Shatterpoint card. I gotta go with Maul, right? Yeah, I got sure. to. So, uh, first things first, Maul's gonna take the combat action and attack one of the Clan Kree's Mandalorians. Crazy dude, I, I, I eviscerate you. I get everything I need, even with your protection from Bo-Katan's ability, I wound them again. So that means their time's up soon, but for now they get to stay on the board. They get, they're gonna get another activation in. Yep. So I'm gonna regain control of this point because as we've said before, wounded characters can't hold objectives. Then I'll gain one momentum for wounding a unit and I'll move the struggle tracker three spaces toward my side. All right, well now as luck would have it, I draw these Mandalorians to activate again. So since I'm switching a wound token to be their second injured token, they're gonna be removed from the game at the end of this activation. So with their first action, they're gonna do a focus and then melee attack Maul. The first attack is uh, pretty meager. <laughs> um, I do one damage and pin Maul, but unfortunately with his three expertise, it lets him heal that pin and uh, not really worry about the damage. The second attack is slightly better. Thanks to my critical hit, I'm only left with one success here, so I'm gonna do one damage and shove Maul off the side. The Mandalorians now control the objective and then die, gaining me three struggle points on their way to the grave. Crazy how even like you're about to die, but you still gain control of the objective first. That's cool. This is the way. It means, you know what it means? You're never going to be in a situation where you love your minis and you get one shot and you can't do anything. You'll always get at least one turn with them. Totally. Yeah, it's great. All right, well, I'm up. At the end of my last turn, I refresh my force pool and my order deck, so I'm gonna draw fresh, and I get Gar Saxon. Before anything else, my tactical ability comes into play here, so one of the other Mandalorians across the board gets to jump. Then, I'm going to move and advance with that movement, and then I'm gonna shoot Bo-Katan. And uh, Bo's exposed here, so she can't use expertise in this uh, in this combat when she's defending. With four expertise, I get two crits, which are two successes onto Bo-Katan, and uh, I just shove her a bit. So I'm gonna deal three damage to Bo, and I'll also get a jump and shove. Amazingly, I retake control of this central objective, so at the end of my turn, I'm able to move the struggle token three spaces toward my side. 
Well, things are looking pretty bad for the good guys here. Excuse me? <laughs> From a certain point of view. From a certain point of view. A certain point of view? No, there is no, this is Star Wars. There actually are good guys in this game. So my next activation goes to Bo-Katan. Not much to do here, so I'm just going to do a focus action and then take a shot at Maul. Because of my ability, Mandalore will survive. When I make a focus action, I can do a free dash and heal twice. So in my attack, Maul is wounded. This is pretty good because it gives me one momentum and then since I move the struggle tracker to zero, both Brad and I gain one momentum. All right, I'm up next, and my Super Commandos activate. They're both already engaged with Ahsoka, so first I'll make a focus action and then attack Ahsoka. The Mandalorian Super Commandos have an innate ability called Victory or Death, which gives them Impact 1. This means that if they focus, which they just have, their next melee attack on the same turn gains an extra attack die in addition to the one from the focus action. So, now these Mandos will be attacking Ahsoka with 8 attack dice. Thanks to rolling some defensive expertise, I can downgrade one of Brad's criticals to a normal strike. Dang. The first attack is okay. After all is said and done, Ahsoka takes 3 damage. She also gains a Strained token. Then, I make the second attack with the second Mando. And after all is said and done, I'm left with five successes. I'm gonna choose to go down the central part of the stance tree, and that's gonna add a total of eight damage to the damage pool. That strain token, since she already has a strain, gives Ahsoka just one extra damage, so that's why it's eight. All right, well at this point, I'm gonna use my reactive ability, what's the matter, too fast for you, for two force points. With this, I get to half the damage coming in and deal the other half back to the Mandos. Brutal. So we both take four. All right, well, I thought I could wound Ahsoka there and take the game, but unfortunately, I didn't quite wound her. I do, however, move quite a ways on the struggle tracker, and I'm only one square away from winning at this point. All right, now with uh, probably my last activation, I draw Ahsoka. So I'm just gonna focus and then attack these Mandos and try to kill them once and for all. Four successes go through, which easily brings them down and adds a pin. I take back the objective, and I get one struggle and two momentum. One for wounding the Mandos, and another one because I wasn't able to bring the struggle token back to my side of the tracker. Scrub. Yeah. Alright, well, it's my turn next, and it really doesn't matter who I activate next. I could just pass, do nothing, and uh, I'm gonna get to move at least three spaces on the struggle tracker, and that'll do it for me. Now, we're ending this game here, but in a regular game of Shatterpoint, we'd go on to either one or two more struggles. At the start of the next struggle, the struggle tracker would completely reset, and which objectives are active, inactive, and priority would all change. Everything else though, including the location of characters on the board, their health, force pulls, all that, that all stays the same. So it's kind of a best of three, but also not in a way. It's really cool. And very interestingly, even though losing the first struggle feels a bit demoralizing, in every practice game we've played, they've gone to a third struggle. Yeah, the loser of the first struggle kind of gets an advantage. They get some say in which objectives are active in the next struggle. So yeah, there's lots of comeback mechanics. So that brings us to the end of our how to play battle. And it's worth noting that there are lots of rules and interactions and situations that we weren't able to get to in this one. So please use the link in the description to check out the full core rules for yourself. This is more of just a primer and to uh, get you going. Yep, I uh, really hope you enjoyed this half how to play, half battle report. Uh, we've got a Patreon with some supporters in our Mountain Goat and 1HP Gang tiers. All these awesome people are really making this channel happen and they're going to be helping bring more Shatterpoint battle reports to you in the future. We also want to shout out Skirmish Mats for supplying us with this Desolate Dunes mat. Beautiful, we got affiliate links in the description. And of course, 
A massive thank you to Atomic Mass Games for sending us these early review copies. Honestly, they're they're amazing. Totally. I mean, it's uh, it's so nice to be able to get this stuff out in time with the game launch and uh, be able to bring it to everyone. So yeah, a massive thanks there, and uh, hopefully we can keep doing it in the future. Yep. I feel like I got a seat at the council, and I'm a master, dude. It's amazing. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for sticking around. More Shatterpoint coming soon, so make sure you like and sub. Yeah, so I think that's it for now, Vic. Yeah, see you next time for a uh, full battle report. Bye.